New revelations today from the Chicago Tribune that the Willow Creek Mega Church, based in South Barrington, paid three and a quarter million dollars to settle lawsuits over child sex abuse by a church volunteer. That's the latest controversy for the church undergoing a massive shift in leadership as waves of elders and church leaders resign in the wake of allegations against the mega church's founder and spiritual leader. Pastor Bill Hybels has not admitted any wrongdoing, but he stepped down in April after a host of women accused him of inappropriate touching, comments, and even a long-term extramarital affair. Here to talk about the future of the troubled Willow Creek Church is Manya Brashear Pashman, the Chicago Tribune's religion reporter who broke the story about Bill Hybels along with her colleague Jeff Cohen. Manya, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, as we just mentioned, your colleague at the Trib broke a story this afternoon that the church paid more than three and a quarter million dollars to settle lawsuits over sexual abuse of two de developmentally disabled boys by a church volunteer in this instance. How much trouble is this church in? Well, it remains to be seen. I mean, I think that uh, the past almost five months have been a very turbulent time for Willow Creek, um, starting with the allegations that uh, surfaced in March uh, against Bill Hybels and uh, were added, added to by allegations reported in Christianity Today magazine and then finally the New York Times. Um, ten women altogether have come forward um, and alleged that Bill Hybels uh, acted inappropriately with them. Um, and when I say inappropriate behavior, this is you know, suggestive comments, extended hugs by a pastor who apparently didn't like to hug, um, and uh, and you know, invitations to hotel rooms. So um, and so and the the church's response has evolved in the past five months, and so it remains to be seen what the next stage of that evolution will be and whether they can recover from it. Give us a little bit of background on Willow Creek Church. How big is it? It's in South Barrington. We know that much. So it was founded by Bill Hybels 42 years ago, gosh, now going on 43 years ago, uh, in a rented movie theater in Palatine. Um, just a, a few members, and Bill Hybels went door to door asking people why they may not go to church and developed a model to bring the unchurched to church. Uh, the, it grew and grew, and thousands of people now attend Willow Creek. Their main campus is in South Barrington. They have seven satellite campuses around the Chicagoland area. Um, up to 25,000 members go to worship there every weekend. Um, and then they also have the Willow Creek Association, which is a group of about 11,000 churches globally, worldwide, that are loosely affiliated with Willow Creek in that they look to Willow Creek as a model of how to do church. And I think the New York Times reported this, what, this church is but the fifth largest megachurch in the country. It Sizable. is definitely one of the largest, yes, yes. Um, so one woman, one of the accusers, says that she said that she had a consensual affair with Pastor Hybels but retracted her story. What happened there? So she had confided in a friend um, years ago um, that this extramarital affair had taken a place over a long period of time, about 14 years. Um, that Those conversations went on for about a year um, and the friend, who was also a former church leader, thought that it was time to take this to the elders. The elders are charged with holding the pastor accountable accountable at the church and she thought this was something that Bill Hybels should be held accountable for if true. And so she took it to the elders in order for them to do an inquiry. Um, they confronted Bill Hybels, he denied it. Um, an elder contacted the woman, she denied it. Um, there, was, um, there was some talk about email exchanges between Bill Hybels and the woman and an elder did discover that over 1100 emails had been exchanged between the pastor and this woman over about a two year time period but they couldn't access those emails and therefore the investigation ended. Uh, there was a second investigation that was renewed later on and there was just never any evidence presented that um, that proved that this affair took place, plus the woman denied it, So, and as did Bill Hybels. So there was no need, the elders believed, to continue pushing this. But the former church leaders, um, who were kind of gathering or, or uh, growing in number um, in, with concerns, 
they disagreed and they continued to push. So how did more allegations begin to come out then? So the conversations continued. Um, they started contacting other former church leaders, some of them women, because note Willow Creek is known for being a progressive evangelical church that allows women to preach, allows women, empowers women to be teaching pastors and leaders. And so some of these leaders said, wait a minute, I had an awkward hug 10 years ago. Wait a minute. I had that moment um, when he invited me to stay a few extra days in Spain. Um, that was one of the allegations um, by former teaching pastor Nancy Beach. Prominent, um, reputable women who, uh, who you know, had stories to share and everybody started to recognize patterns um, in, what, in the stories that they were sharing. And so um, they pushed and pushed the elders over a four year time period. And then they, they finally, when they got nowhere, um, decided to come to the Tribune. Hybels vigor vigorously denied these accusations. At first, the church uh, defended him and um, didn't believe the women. What changed? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it really has been an evolving response over this nearly five-month period of time since the story broke in March. Um, indeed, Bill Hybels called some of the allegations flat-out lies. The elders defended them, so did the co-pastors. Um, and then when Bill Hybels resigned um, or stepped down early, six months um, before he was supposed to retire, um, to get out of the way of the ministry, um, then the elders came forward and, and kind of offered a limited apology for maybe not all of the allegations were lies. Fast forward to early July, um, Steve Carter, the teaching pastor who had been named as one of Bill Hybels' successors, he posted a public apology uh, on his personal blog, and that prompted Heather Larson, the lead pastor, to step up into the pulpit the next night and give her own apology, and the elders to release a written statement. Um, and then uh, fast forward again to last week, and uh, the, new, the allegation was reported, the mo most severe allegation was reported in the New York Times, and that prompted Steve Carter to immediately announced his resignation, which little did we know he had tendered weeks before, um, but the elders had asked him to stay. And then on Wednesday, Heather Larson and the entire elder team announced that they were stepping down. Um, Hybels himself, he stepped down in the spring, but he still denies everything. As far as we know, we haven't really heard much from Bill Hybels since he stepped down. Um, and uh, I believe the New York Times got a statement from him denying the most severe allegation, but that's the, the most recent we've heard from him. He has not offered comment or, or circled back to, to do anything. Well, welcome to Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short. And by, by, by now, I'm sure that you've all heard about the endless uh, clergy abuse scandals in the Catholic Church. You probably heard about the Willow Creek Community Church scandal with their pastor, Bill Hybels. That's an ongoing thing that has not been resolved. Neither has the Roman Catholic Church uh, scandal about uh, Pope Francis knowing about these abusing uh, priests and cardinals and bishops and keeping silent. That still has to continue to play out. and We have to find out whether he in fact did know about that. But <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about today is as a pastor, I know that these kinds of reports, these kinds of news stories uh, really are unsettling for a lot of Christians. Uh, people who go to church, people who attend, people who look to uh, leaders for Bible teaching and uh, spiritual guidance, prayer and counseling and all of the different other ministries, these kinds of reports really take the wind out of their faith. These are the kind of things that just gnaw on an individual in the church. And there are going to be individuals, if past experience teaches us anything, there are going to be individuals who will simply walk away from the church, walk away from Christianity because of these scandals. And so what I wanted to talk about today is in light of the Roman Catholic Church uh, uncertainty around the Pope and the bishops and cardinals and this entire painting of the entire leadership of the Catholic Church as either involved in this or covering up of this, I believe that as Protestant evangelicals we need to make sure that our house is clean 
and there is no hint or taint of this kind of goings on in our churches. There has to be there has to be total transparency, there has to be total openness, there has to be total ability to talk to the congregation with complete honesty and enough of the uh, lawyering of facts, enough of spinning, uh, enough marketing and PR and damage control and all of that kind of stuff as Christians we have to step up and be more scrutinizing of ourselves than the secular world. One of the great uh, tragedies of this whole abusive priest, bishop, cardinal scandal in the Roman Catholic Church is that it takes secular, pagan investigators to uncover this stuff. Now, my question with the Roman Catholic hierarchy is, why aren't you investigating and why aren't you coming down hard on these church leaders that are abusing young people? Why does it take the secular world, the world that the Christian body is trying to teach morality, why does it take the so-called immoral people to undercover and disclose and expose the immorality in the church. Why does it take that? Why isn't the church and why isn't church leadership especially stepping up and cleaning its own house? This is the thing that's so frustrating with the Roman Catholic clergy abuse scandal is that we've heard this all before. We've seen this all before. We've seen back in 2002 when the spotlight investigation came out with the Boston Globe and the clergy abuse of minors was identified as a problem and what we heard what we heard from all of these uh, people was that okay well we're going to really get to the bottom of this and we're going to really uh, solve this problem and there's not going to be any more problems like that and so we're going to we've got this problem solved uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore uh, it's been 16 years since that time and so it's past history over and done well guess what it doesn't like look like it's over and done. Now, there are people in the Roman Catholic Church who will say, well, this is a different problem than before. The other problem was pedophile priests, and today, today, today's problem is actual clergy abuse of post-pubescent minors or younger people, teenagers, teenage boys. So it's a different problem. The problem is still the same old problem, and that is sexual immorality among the clergy. So you can say, well, you know, it's a slightly different problem. Why don't you not do that, and why don't you start getting to the root of the matter and understanding that this is a problem and it has to be solved. This is a problem and it's not going away. This is a problem that has to be dealt with strictly. And that's what's so disturbing about, for example, Pope Francis, he gets on his airplane and he loves to talk and he loves to chat with the reporters and you never know what he's gonna say because he talks so much and the reporters ask him, well, what about this uh, report that you knew something about the uh, cover up of these clergy abuse? And what was his response? Do you think he would begin to open up and talk like he loves to do about everything? No. He says, I'm not going to say one word about this. Do your own investigation. What? That is not transparency. That is not openness. That is ducking and dodging. And we've seen that time and time and time again. And it just shows you that the Roman Catholic Church leadership from the very top has still not understood 
that this has to be dealt with and it has to be dealt with seriously and it has to be dealt with in a strict manner. Supposedly there's a zero tolerance in the Roman Catholic Church over this kind of activity, but it doesn't seem to be dealt with in a very zero tolerance way because the latest report of the grand jury of Pennsylvania uncovered terrible, atrocious activity, present day activity. Now this report did go back decades ago, but it also indicates that there's current, ongoing activity in this same disgusting practices and behaviors. And so clearly this abuse situation has not been dealt with, especially in light of the Cardinal McCarrick incident, where you have this man who is clearly and was widely known among Catholic hierarchy, bishops and cardinals and priests, that this man was abusing teenage boys and seminary students, and it was permitted, it was tolerated. Uh, people either enabled it or they just were silent and they didn't do anything and they didn't say anything because they didn't want to cause scandal or they didn't want to rock the boat or whatever the reason. The Roman Catholic Church has not been dealing with this issue in a healthy way. And what is the consequence of not dealing with this issue? Now you have scandal in the church worse than you would have had if you had dealt directly with the offensive priests and bishops and cardinals. You would have not have had the kind of atmosphere you have right now in the Roman Catholic Church. If I were a Roman Catholic priest or bishop or cardinal, I would be feeling pretty bad right now because your moral authority is almost zero with people. And we saw this happen in Ireland. Ireland was once one of the most strongly, staunchly Roman Catholic churches in the entire world. And the culture was shaped by the Roman Catholic Church. And the values and the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church dominated the whole countryside and the whole population of Ireland. Well, today, most recently, they just had two referendums. And what happened was so-called Roman Catholic Ireland threw out any ban on same-sex marriage. Now that's the law of the land and they threw out any ban on abortion. Now that's the law of the land. In Roman Catholic Ireland, why? Because of this abusive clerical problem in the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church in Ireland has no moral authority, no moral credibility at all, zero, zilch. Nobody listens to the Roman Catholic Church on moral issues in Ireland. That's how you can get that dramatic change from being a staunchly Roman Catholic country that it was imbibed with Roman Catholic moral values to, de to today, which is totally departed from any kind of Catholic morality there. The scandals have taken their toll on this once, a once traditional country. And what's gonna happen with this latest Roman Catholic Church scandal? The same thing. You're gonna see fallout in the US. Now, most of the Roman Catholic dioceses in the United States have been consolidating. They've been closing parishes, closing cathedrals, just great big church buildings, uh, combining churches, just basically shrinking in every uh, estimate of population and presence in our country here. Well, that's gonna only accelerate. And so the Roman Catholic Church is in big trouble because of their own doing. They haven't dealt with this immorality in the leadership of the church. Now, mind you, this is, the leadership of a church is supposed to be the moral leadership and the spiritual leadership. That's their primary purpose. And if you don't have credibility 
on moral and spiritual issues, you have no credibility on anything. You can talk about immigration, you can talk about climate change, you can talk about all these other side things, but you don't have authority primarily on those issues anyway. So this is a huge problem for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we as evangelical Protestants, we can't say, well, you know, that's a Catholic problem. I'm glad that we don't have to deal with that problem. No, we can't take that attitude. The reason we can't take that attitude is because the whole church, Christian uh, church leadership is being tainted by the scandals in the Roman Catholic Church. All of it. There's not going to be some, well, we're going to escape the problem because we're Protestants, we're not Catholic. No. We don't have, I don't believe, in the Protestant churches, evangelical churches, we don't have the same problem that the Roman Catholic Church has. I don't think abusive pastors are, are really problems in the Protestant churches. I'm sure that happens. I believe the record shows that that does happen in some instances, but I don't think it's anywhere near the way it was in the Roman Catholic Church. But we do have scandals like the Bill Hybels scandal. We do have problems. And what we have to do is certainly not cover up these problems. What we have to do is certainly not try to pretend that we don't have a problem when there is a problem. And <clears throat> this is why, as far as the uh, Willow Creek Community Church scandal goes, I have always been an advocate for due process and having everyone have their day in court. So I have been urging people to let the process go and let justice be administered and don't rush to judgment about Bill Hybels because that's very easy to do in today's day and age. We see a report, uh, we read an accusation in the newspaper and all of a sudden okay, well, he's guilty already. Why? Because someone reported him as guilty. That's, that's not fair. That is totally not fair. And so we have to resist the urge to do that. We need to be able to say, okay, well, he deserves his day in court. He needs to be uh, given the opportunity to defend himself. And so I have always been urging people, let Bill Hybels answer the charges against him and don't rush to judgment. Don't get on the internet, uh, don't get on podcasts, don't get on radio or television or in public and say, I believe the women, because that's not letting Bill Hybels answer these charges against him. It's irresponsible to say, I believe the women. They have not been cross-examined. They have not been questioned uh, by someone to test the claims that they have given, to look at their credibility. I'm sure all of these women are not of equal credibility weight. So some of them are highly credible, and maybe some of them are not so highly credible. So we have to do this in a proper order due process way and give Bell Hybel the benefit of the doubt because that's the way our justice system works. You're innocent until proven guilty. You're not guilty until you have to prove that you're innocent. And that's what Bill Hybels finds himself into right now. He's in the situation where he is almost entirely guilty and now he has to prove his innocence because this is playing out in the court of public opinion, internet, chat rooms, comment boxes, and so forth, and that's not justice. So I have always been an advocate that we need to give 
Bill Hybels a chance to defend himself and to hear how he explains these charges. Now we've seen a little bit of that in March of this year when he was talking to his congregation when the Willow Creek Board of Elders were explaining to the congregation that their investigations in the past over a period of years have led them to conclude that he is not guilty of these charges. Their findings, and it was done not once but a number of times in investigations, that they found him not guilty and so Bill Hybels did explain some of these charges and gave reasons. Now, are those reasons plausible? Are those reasons sound? Well, again, he would have to be cross-examined. That's the way it's done in court. To get to the bottom of who's telling the truth and who isn't. Okay, so it's been about a month since the latest and most damaging accusation against Bell Hybels will level and it was in the New York Times and so people began to automatically judge Bill Hybels as guilty and I began to say on my channel here that give him his due process let him answer these charges now the the sad thing is so far is that we have not heard from Bill Hybels in about a month. Uh, when this latest and most damaging charge against him appeared in the New York Times, uh, he sent an email to them. I think they reached out to him for a comment. He sent an email and he said, I deny all of these charges against me categorically. And so he's on record as saying this did not happen. But since then, we've not heard a thing about him. There has been, to my knowledge, no interview. He hasn't sat down with any interviewer. He has not put forth any kind of a, a written statement. He has not made any kind of presentation. You know, in a day of internet digital media, uh, you can put together a presentation. You can talk to people in the matter of seconds by going on YouTube or going on Facebook. Uh, there's video capabilities on Facebook that you can put out a Facebook message and you can use Twitter. You can use hundreds of different means to get your message out. And so far, Bill Hybels hasn't said anything since this latest accusation. So, unfortunately for Bill, and again, I feel he gets his due day in court, but again, the reality of the situation is the longer you remain silent, the more it looks like you're guilty. The more you don't comment on charges against you, the more you remain silent in clearing your name and your reputation, the more it looks like there's probably something to the accusation. Now that's the perception. Now maybe there's something totally different. There's a different explanation as to why Bill Hybels hasn't said anything but I would say that he needs to begin to communicate to people who are trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. 